we're back on. All right. So let me redo this again. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. No problem. Um, okay, so those of you that were that were on, uh, that were looking at, that were looking at the show, we're going to start over again because we had a glitch that was that was on the problem there with the. Uh, with Facebook, you know, uh, that always happens sometimes, not all the time. But anyway, uh, we're here with Benjamin Hoffman, and we're talking about the blacksmith in the colonial days, uh, but is also related to how the Old West was back in the Old West. And uh, how are you doing today, uh, Benjamin? Just doing great, sir. I hope the same to you. Great. Okay, so... Uh, I'm going to start out with a question for you. Uh, how did you first get involved in blacksmithing? Well, it began at an early age. Um, back in grade school, I always loved and had a deep appreciation for early American history. Um, when the history books had come out, you know, all my classmates would cringe, and uh, I loved every minute of it. So back in those days, it's longer ago than I'd like to admit, you know, uh, late 80s, early 90s, there was no internet, so the best resource place to uh, sort of dive into that realm was the library, so thankfully mom and dad took many trips there, and I was able to get my hands on, you know, early resource materials, I guess you could say, and anything I had a chance to read up on, you know, the early pioneers, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and uh, like-minded individuals. That would occupy a lot of my time. Uh, there, probably early teen years, I kind of got sick of just reading about it, and I wanted to experience it in a more hands-on approach. There you so go. I came across another magazine called Muzzle Blast, and here come to find out there was a whole group of individuals throughout the country who were like me in an early age, but uh, wanted a more hands-on approach, and here they were into what was called living history, and these were people that actually researched uh, certain personas through history, whether it be, you know, a soldier, a frontiersman, a mountain man, or whatnot, and they would uh, fabricate all their own clothing and tools, and, um, you know, some of them chose the path of the blacksmith, and that was kind of where I got into it, and it kind of just snowballed from there. Um, probably the first thing I wanted was uh, a black powder rifle and the accoutrements to go with it. But I couldn't really afford what I wanted. So even though I was just an early teen, I thought, well, I could probably afford a few basic tools and materials and make my own and kind of research that. And that's when the blacksmithing kind of came in. Uh, my cousin, who lived near me at the time, he rigged up a primitive forge made out of a brake drum, uh, plumbing parts, and a hair dryer for the air source. So we got together mm-hmm. one afternoon and set out about to heat and beat metal, as they say, and I was kind of bit by the bug then, and shortly thereafter rigged up my own primitive uh, blacksmith shop where I used a barbecue grill bowl, plumbing parts, and a hair dryer, and uh, set out to start fabricating various iron work and eventually got into the knives, and I didn't know it at the time, but I was kind of bit by the bug, and really, as I said, just snowballed from there. There you go. I'm, I'm sure uh, you had to get some tools and all that kind of stuff, too, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You kind of have to have a few basic tools, you know. Um, my cousin, he had an old section of uh, railroad track that had somebody had given that he cut. We used that as our anvil. Uh, so, you know, we had something to pound on. Um, there there's any number of ways that you can rig up a forge. And like I said, a barbecue grill and uh, plumbing parts, pipes that you can get from a home supply store. That can be your duct work. And uh, I used a hair dryer and actually made a lot of nice knife blades just using that as my first primitive setup. But you do need a few basic tools. You know, you need some hammers, uh, some tongs to hold the material with, uh, something to hold your fire with, and of course a, uh, an air source, which, like I said, a hair dryer worked uh, the early years there. But yeah, you need a few basic tools to get going. I'm sure back in those days, you know, that, that the uh, blacksmith Whenever they were, I'm just curious, whenever they were first getting their their tools, you know, they probably had to make their own tools, them uh-huh. being a blacksmith, right? I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I said them being a blacksmith, I'm sure they had to make their own tools, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, even today, a lot of times, uh, if I need a particular, you know, uh, a tool, an offset tool, tongs or whatever, a lot of them uh, would go about it, uh, you know, back in the colonial period and westward expansion, would make a lot of their own tools, their own hammers and whatnot, and even today, a lot of blacksmiths do that. One of the first items that I made, of course, I had a hammer, but that's all I had, and you needed a little angle hook to keep my uh, coal fire under control, and that's the very first thing I forged was a tool, a little, I still have it today, hangs on the side of my forge, and, uh, but yeah, a lot of them, uh, you know, you couldn't just go down to the local hardware store because that didn't exist, right. so a lot right. of blacksmiths, and, uh, you know, indeed gunsmiths and other tradesmen, you had to be able to create your own tools for use, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, and uh, did you have an apprenticeship whenever you started doing your, your craftsmanship? An uh, early westward expansion and earlier in colonial times, that's pretty much the way it was. You would apprentice um, under a master blacksmith for a number of years till you had perfected your craft, and then you were allowed to go into business yourself. Um, that's a little less common today, and Fortunately or rather unfortunately, it depends on how you look at it, I did not have an apprenticeship. I'm largely self-taught. I gained uh, most of my knowledge through instruction books, um, DVDs, but probably the best teacher was trial and error, which is kind of the long way around the mountain. In other words, I learned how to do it right by doing it wrong many, many, many times. And, you know, if I had uh, a pickup truckload of all the equipment that there are uh, knives and whatnot that I've messed up, it'd be a lot more than I'd be willing to admit. So I'm largely self-taught. Um, if somebody is interested in getting into blacksmithing or knife making, I would probably recommend that you take a class. If you do an online search, um, there's many places across the country that offer that. And it'll save you a lot of time and frustration. Little things that maybe you wouldn't even think about, they can show you, you know, how to go about it right the first way and save you a lot of frustration. So unfortunately, like I said, I took the long, long path around and learned how to do it right by doing it wrong so many times. But that's <laughs> right. the way it goes sometimes. Right. Well, you know, uh, trial and error, I guess, is what they call it, right? It, there was a whole lot of trial and a whole lot of error. Yeah, I, I get <laughs> people occasionally now that will come up to our table at a show and whatnot and say, oh, I could never make something like that. And I always just kind of laugh and say, well, for many, many years, neither could I. There was a whole lot of uh, error that uh, I cranked out before I was able to make something that was usable. So that's nothing to hang your head about. You know, that's the learning experience. Right. So most of the stuff that you do is, is kind of like uh, uh, from scratch or you use it from other other things I know people that make knives they sometimes they use uh, other other things like uh, what do you call them uh, mine went blank there a little bit but uh, 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 go, go ahead. ahead go ahead um, as far as like materials and whatnot go um, I do salvage some uh, one source that makes real good knives are antique files. Uh, they're not all right. created equal, though. You have to do a, uh, a steel test on them because a lot of the files that were made in the 70s and uh, the 80s are just case-hardened. They're not high-carbon tool steel, and they won't make good knives. But, um, yeah, you can salvage uh, old antique files. They make good knife blades. Uh, antique leaf springs off of the early cars, they make good knife springs. And then all of you, the scrap, you know, uh, iron, brass, and whatnot, uh, just because it had a former life as something else doesn't mean you can't make good materials with it. And they did that a lot in the 18th and 19th century because, again, they couldn't just go to a local supply store if you were out on the frontier and, uh, you know, you needed a guard for a knife. Um, all right couldn't just go buy a hunk of steel, but maybe you had an old uh, disheveled hinge that you could cut apart and reshape and turn into one. And to a certain degree, I do that today. I'm always on the lookout at flea markets and uh, antique stores for raw materials, if you will, to go about it in the, kind of the same fashion they did. Nice, nice. So what is the basic process that you use for forging knives and axes? Well, the basic process first starts um, 
course, you have to have a forge. And again, like we talked about earlier, there's any number of ways that you can rig one of those up. And uh, I burn coal in mine. It's a traditional method that was used in the 18th and 19th centuries, and it's powered by a hand crank air blower. Um, again, no, numerous ways you can do that. I kind of go the traditional method. But um, before you do that, you have to have knife-making steel. Uh, what I use is a bar stock that I buy called 1095 High Carbon, also 1084, and as we already said, antique files. And um, not to get into too tech, much technical detail, but those types of steel are what are known as simple high carbon steels, meaning that they basically just contain iron and steel, and it's, it's considered traditional uh, blade material, and it's very, very similar to what was used in the 18th and 19th century, and that's the reason that I use it today, so that I'm giving somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, the type of uh, steel that you could uh, acquire in 18th and 19th century. But uh, so after you get your fire going with your coal, your blade steel goes into the fire, and there's a whole process to that that probably don't have quite enough time to get into. But you bring it up to temperature, uh, you take it out on your anvil, and using the tongs to hold on to the steel, uh, the anvil, the hammer. I typically have some safety equipment on, too. I have a leather shop apron because that hot slag flying all over the shop will uh, catch your pants and shirt on fire pretty yeah, quick. Absolutely. And my protection and gloves, too. <laughs> and uh, with just those simple basic tools, which is what they used in the 18th and 19th century, you go about shaping your blade. And there's little tricks that you use uh, that you can use uh, different spots on the anvil and whatnot uh, to shape the blade, depending on what kind of length and shape you're going for. But um, I try to get as much as possible shaped and done on the anvil as I can without having to rely on anything else because that will save you a whole lot of time come finishing if you can get your blade, whatever the shape, close to finish on the forge. You'll have very little cleanup work. Right. Uh, after you get your blade roughly forged to shape, it goes through a cycle of heat-ups and cool-downs, and that's just allowing the structure of the steel to uh, relax and release all the stress from the hammering and the pounding, and that's important when you get onto your heat treating later to keep the blade straight. Okay. After that's done, uh, you go about final shaping your blade. That's where I do cheat a little bit. I have an electric grinder because that's a very, very uh, laborious process. Uh, they did it with hand files in the 18th century. I kind of do it with a combination. Again, being in this to make my living, i got to move a little quicker. So I'll rough out my shape with a grinder, the uh, the profile of the blade, and also the bevel, the cutting edge. Uh, when that's all done, I'll rough fit it to uh, the handle material, whatever that is. You know, it could be wood, uh, bone, deer antler. If the knife has any mounts, and what we're referring to when we say mounts is the guard, the bolster, the pommel, any pins that we're going to use. Uh, when it's close to being done but not quite done, after that we go ahead and we'll do our heat treat. And the heat treat is what makes or breaks your knife blade. Uh, in layman's terms, just to quickly run you through the process, you'll take the blade and very slowly heat it up on the forge till you reach uh, critical temperature, what it's called. It's a certain temperature. Right. And you'll quench the blade. In my case, again, I try and do things as traditional as possible. I use a pure vegetable oil. And what that does is it uh, thrusts the molecules. I'll get real technical on you here. Uh, okay. Steel and uh, or carbon and iron together. If you looked at it under a microscope, they're thrust together. And that makes the steel super, super hard, and uh, but it's very, very brittle. It's hard, but if you were to drop it on the floor at this stage, it'd snap it in half. And I learned wow. that lesson the hard way years ago. <laughs> so you got to be careful with it. Exactly. Um, when you're done at that point, you do what's called tempering. Many different ways you can accomplish that. Again, I kind of go with traditional methods called a soft back draw. And what that is is I'll take and lay that blade on a steel table and cover the cutting edge with a heavy piece of steel so just the back of the knife blade is showing and paint a propane torch on the back of that and watch for colors to start to appear. And that's nice. the oxidation of the steel as it's reacting to the heat. And what it's doing, it's just softening that knife blade a little bit. In other words, pulling those uh, molecules apart. And it has a color range that uh, shows the oxidation. What you want is a real dark blue on the back, the spine. 
fine end of the knife, and then down near the cutting edge, a real, real dark brown. And what that does is it lets the back of the knife have a little bit of flexibility, and it also softens the edge just a hair, just enough to where you've also got toughness, but now that you've softened it, you've got flexibility, and you have a good, sturdy, usable knife. I usually repeat that process three times to get rid of the tempering, that is, to get rid of any brittleness that might be in there. There you go. When you're... When you're done with that, you go ahead and finish to whatever degree you want. Again, I mostly use hand tools, um, files and whatnot. I do have, uh, you know, an electric drill, a few other things like that to save some time with the tedious stuff. But, again, I'm trying to replicate knives from a bygone era and using most of the same tools and techniques that they used back then so that the end result is close to what they had. But right. uh, after you're finished with that process, you'll go ahead and final fit your handle and all your mounts to it. Um, typically, I will antique my knives just a little bit, um, not using anything modern. I use all the same recipes and formulas they had back then, just to dull the colors down a little bit so that it doesn't look like a new shiny penny in the woods or field. Uh, sharpen the knife. If it's to have a sheath, we make a sheath for it, and uh, you're ready to go in the woods for uh, whatever you might need a knife for. Nice, nice. So that, that's the nutshell version, that's so a, hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Well, I, I'm sure some of, the, some of the people that are watching here, too, they're, they're probably going to have some questions about uh, different things, but uh, when you build your, your, uh, your knives and your axes, they're all period correct, right? That's correct, yeah. And what do you do to to use them as references with? Well, as far as being period correct, just to maybe your uh, some of your listeners don't know what that means. What that means is, is the steel type, um, the handles, the mounts, and many of the techniques are as they would have been used in the 18th and 19th century. The reason being is I, I market my knives as historically correct for people who are involved in living history. Um, collectors, you know, want that kind of thing. And they're not just props. They're made to use, and you can take them out and use them. But uh, as far as the research for them goes, there's a number of very fine uh, books that are available that show a great many original knives that have photographs, um, detailed measurements, and so forth. And that's a really good uh, way you can go about it. One of the best books, if your listeners want to write it down, it's called The Knife and Homespun America. And that's by Mr. Madison Grant. And it's really a treasure trove for knives from about 1700 on up to the 1850s and again many fine photographs uh, details measurements that if you're looking to replicate something from a certain time period you know you've got the, the genuine thing uh, also of course the internet nowadays is full of resources if you just punch up uh, you know 18th or 19th century belt knives um, many museums have their inventories online now along with uh, measurements and whatnot and of course, you never want to pass up uh, an opportunity to examine uh, an original artifact if you can. That's probably the best method. But those three areas, books, the Internet, and, of course, hands-on examination of a real thing are how I go about uh, replicating certain knives so that I'm giving uh, customers as close to as possible as uh, the real McCoy. So are some of these knives, are they, uh, you know, like back in the 1800s, they used them mainly for, like, you know, around the house, and uh, also whenever right. they went to go uh, shoot shoot a deer or kill a bear or something like that, they had to have certain knives that was that was made in a certain way, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, most of the knives that I replicate are what you would call um, general purpose knives. Now, some people they'll come up to our table at a show and they might say, "Well, is this knife only used for a certain task?" And uh, the early frontiersmen and whatnot. They couldn't really afford to only buy a knife that was, uh, you know, only used for a specific tasks. They needed a do-all knife. Right. So when, that's the same mindset we take when we make them nowadays. So, you know, you can use it to field dress game. Um, of course, in those days, they used them for self-defense, if need be, you know, close quarters weapon. Um, you could also use it around, you know, the homestead there in the kitchen and, you know, pretty much anything you could think of that uh, you might have need of a blade in those days, and indeed what we're replicating nowadays is you can take it out and use it too. So it's not just a 
you know, this knife will only, you know, it's only good for hunting and nothing else. They're, they're kind of general purpose, and they were then, and we still make them that way nowadays. Nice, nice. So, uh, how do you go about uh, uh, researching the items again, I guess? Well, uh, like we said there earlier, it's probably the best way to go about it. There's uh, numerous books um, that you can find. The one we already mentioned there. Another really good one is called uh, American Primitive Knives by Mr. Gordon B. Minus. That's full of a treasure trove of them. Uh, another book is called Swords, Blades of the American Revolution by George C. Newman. That's full of great resources. And uh, another one is Sketches, Hunting Pouches, Powder Horns, and Accoutrements of Southern Appalachia. And all of those books are probably, those four that I mentioned, are the best way if you want to go about it in that way. And that's, that's a lot of how I get my information because they're full of, you know, photographs. And, of course, measurements are very important if you want to replicate it, you know, down to a detail. And then also there's many resources, historical image banks, uh, online that you can use and uh, pull those resources up and a lot of, a lot of stuff that you know 20 years ago that wasn't available because the internet was in its infancy all that stuff's online now and of course right. you can get details and measurements and everything off of there so those two sources are probably the number one way that I go about uh, researching a specific blade from a time period right now this is kind of an off the wall question because I always like to throw in whenever I do the show, an off-the-wall question of which, uh, did did some of the Native Americans even make knives of their own, or or, or was it as, even related? As far as um, Native Americans actually having the ability, um, metallurgy ability, no, they didn't uh, dabble in or have the ability to go about forging their own knives. Generally, they would always acquire them, um, you know, through trade or a battlefield pickup. But they had just as much use for a good steel knife as, you know, frontiersmen and westward expansion pioneers did. Um, the two main type of knives that Native Americans probably carried um, starting in the early 1700s were what known as, they called them back then, scalping knives. Uh -huh. uh, butcher's knives, we call them trade knives nowadays. And uh, two main countries supplied them. England and France imported those by the tens of thousands. And the French and the English version, um, they're vastly different from one another, but they're just a good, plain, basic, uh, again, general purpose knife. I replicate a lot of those for guys that are interested in that type of knife nowadays. But those were traded to the Indians by the tens of thousands. Many, many, many of them carried them. Uh, as far as the Indians making their own knives, you know, they would in earlier times go about that with, you know, flint and obsidian like you would arrowhead chip and uh, flake out a knife blade. But as right. far as a good steel knife went, they didn't really dabble in or have the ability to go about forging and making their own uh, type of weapons. They had to rely on the blacksmiths around the forts and the trading posts to uh, provide that kind of thing. So Right. So, uh, I'm going to throw in another one more question and then we'll, we'll uh, start to wrap it up. But anyway, um, back in the Civil War days, do you, st do you make those, uh, I forgot what you call them, that they put at the end of the rifles? <laughs> the bayonets? <laughs> yeah, the bayonets. Uh, um, I have made a couple of them. Um, around about the time of the Civil War, that really wasn't an item that was being forged. Um, the Industrial Revolution is starting to come online, and a lot of that stuff that blacksmiths in the earlier time period, um, you know, back in the, the Revolutionary War might have forged, it, that started to get switched over to casting. So mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff um, from around the Civil War, not all of it, especially on the southern side, a lot of their goods were still being forged, a lot of their fighting knives and whatnot. But uh, as far as the bayonets, uh, most of them were being manufactured on a mass production level, so the blacksmith was starting to kind of fade away a little bit by that time period. But I have made one or two of them for, again, the early muskets. There you go. Well, so. you know, you have uh, a lot of a lot of knife and, and axe experience, so 
uh, we want to let the let the viewers know and let's let's see if we have any questions from the viewers to ask you uh, since since we're here and we have a little bit of time here to to do it all uh, right so let's let's give just probably a couple minutes or so maybe someone will pop up a question or something like that uh, yeah that's fine any questions you might have there, there's no stupid question that's you know sometimes people are a little sheepish to bring a certain question up and that's how you know you learn and get answers so there's there's no question that uh, isn't significant so exactly well you know i'm not a blacksmith so i, I don't know anything about it um i have put a couple of handles on a knife or or so uh -huh. just for uh just for reproduction of it i did I did a handle of a uh, pick of a pickaxe that that I was using for okay. for that, but uh, mm -hmm. other than that, uh, nothing great and wonderful. Um, so, <laughs> so, Go ahead. so it's uh, it's quite interesting. You have some wonderful uh, items that that you have where people can get a hold of you. Mm -hmm. um, Tell, tell the audience about how they can get a hold of you and the process of, of uh, trying to get something from you. Okay. Uh, the best way that you can see the wares that we have for sale is uh, even though I operate in the, you know, the, the days gone by, the old-time blacksmith, we are up to date. So we're online, and uh, we have a website where they can go and see read all about uh, how we go about making items and also purchase items at our website. The address is www.hoffmanreproductions.com. That will take you to our website. Um, all our contact information is on there, but if somebody would rather just contact us directly, our email is hoffmanreproductions at yahoo.com. And uh, either of those ways will work to get a hold of us. And, again, if somebody's interested in uh, purchase, purchasing some of our wares, they're all on there for sale. And uh, as time permits, we also take on uh, custom order work, which uh, I'm happy to go back and forth with any individual that might have something interesting in mind. So either of those ways work good. Great. And you do this full time, right? Yeah, it was a, uh, a part-time business there a number of years ago, but kind of ramped it up into full-time, and I'm uh, blessed to be able to stay near the house here and uh, go to forging every day, and yes, sir, make it a full-time living. There you go. And you just got a brand new addition to your family, too, right? Yeah, it was just uh, my wife and myself for the past five years, but here back about three months ago, we had a wonderful little baby boy and uh, hopefully he'll he'll carry on the family business one day so he there can't quite lift the hammer yet it'll be a little while till he's <laughs> there but uh, he's a good addition anyway well you can always give him that little plastic hammer and that's a start right there you go yeah my mom was <laughs> telling me we need to get uh, one of those little hammer wooden blocks only turn the block into an anvil and give him a blacksmithing hammer and make it look more uh, more correct for his dad there you go <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tell you what, uh, we didn't have any questions yet. Um, oh, that's fine. I, I was hoping that we would. Um, anybody that's out there after the show is over, you can always uh, throw in a couple of questions uh, on there. And uh, uh, Benjamin, we we appreciate you being on the show for how the old west was live show. Uh, we're looking forward to having a lot of people get in touch with you. Uh, we're, we're definitely looking for some more, uh, things that we can do shows on. So if you or anybody that you know that has anything, uh, related to the Old West, uh, have them get in touch with me as well. Uh, Ben, we, we appreciate you very much. You, you put in a lot of insight on this. People are going to get a lot of education out of it, I'm sure. Um. And we appreciate you being on the, on How the Old West Was live show. Well, I really appreciate it too, Bill. I had a good time with you here, and hopefully yes, your listeners enjoyed it. And uh, happy to work with anybody if we get in contact later on down the road. So thank you so much. All right. You have a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us at How You're the Old West welcome. Was. Thank you.